The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Petronelle Nivot. After completing her university studies, Petronelle joined the Endangered Species Protection Unit of the South African Police Service, where she held the rank of captain. In 1999, she left the police service and started the Game Capture School, which focused on the best practices for wildlife capture, care, and management. Petronelle also started the Sundela and Tamboti Wildlife Centers. In 2011, she moved to Mpumalanga, where her passion for the protection of wildlife resulted in the founding of Care for Wild, a rescue and a rehabilitation center for all wildlife in need. In this conversation, we talk about Petronelle's youth growing up on a farm surrounded by wildlife. We go into her journey of conservation that led up to the founding of Care for Wild. Petronelle tells beautiful stories about all of the sacrifices that many people have made in working to save the rhino species. Everything from dangerous helicopter flights to rangers risking their lives to the endless long hours the caretakers put into keeping these orphan survivors alive. This episode is truly a journey of passion and love for the people and animals of this amazing planet. So let's jump into the conversation. Hi, Petronel. Welcome to the Rhino Man podcast. So excited to have you on here. Thank you so much, John. I can't wait to just share a little bit of the Care for Wild journey and history with you guys. Absolutely. And speaking of that, why don't you just give us a little bit of background, what you, what you do at Care for Wild and what Care for Wild is for people that don't know. Now, Care for Wild is much more than the orphanage of baby rhinos. It's basically at the moment what we're doing is, is to secure viable, free-ranging black and white rhino breeding populations in this definitely healthy ecosystems that we're working with every day. And it's definitely supported by a sustainable development model that we can talk a little bit more about. And, you know, the protection and the empowerment of these rural communities, it's basically at the heart of, of the conservation. So in short, it all started off as, you know, rescue babies, uh, rhino babies and rehabilitate them and the, then rewild them. But over the last 10 years, if you rewild them and release them, there must be an ongoing protection of the orphans or the injured rhinos. So, um, and this is what makes this such an interesting conversation with you guys. It's a rhino man. It's all about the rangers. So when we have these babies here, the rangers is also uh, protecting us as the keepers mm. um, while we do our job and uh, keeping us safe and also keeping the rhino safe. And I think it's a different model that we can also discuss a little bit more uh, while we're talking. Yeah, thank you, Petronelle. And yeah, you're doing way more than just uh, caring for rhino orphans, which is a huge job in itself. But uh, before we get into the details of Care for Wild and uh, the rhino orphans, can you give us some background on how you got connected to conservation to begin with? Where did this all start for you? I think I'm born with it. You know, I think uh, God just put the stick on me and say, hey, you better go and, and look after the animals in the kingdom, you know, in the creation. And I was very privileged and blessed to, to carry that and grew up on a farm with wildlife, with cattle, with all sorts. My dad also planted and mom a teacher mm. and uh, a great love for conservation and the soil and the water. Many days we would have stepped out in the felt and um, on the different areas where my, where my dad was farming. So in a tent and making a fire and so on. So I thought this is the way people live. I, <laughs> I thought people uh, no, have animals always with them. So when I had to go to school I and to university actually in Johannesburg, I said to my dad, but the, I don't understand how, how, how can people live without these animals? You know, how does this work? And I thought all people work and live with animals around them, you know, and always with them. 
So on the farm, you know, the, the, the doors of the house will always be open. So either there's sheep in or an antelope that my mom was he hand rearing to put back in the felt or a bird or owl. I thought that's how people live. And I'm so glad because then it's, it's nothing more for me. I don't have to make too much of an effort to just carry on with that type of lifestyle. And I, I was just so privileged and blessed to have animals wild and tamed always around us. Yeah. And maybe this is a good point to ask this question, which is why do you feel that this wildlife is so important to protect because from the outside or people that maybe have grown up in cities, they don't have that connection you had uh, when you were growing up. But why do you think this is something worth fighting for? I, at one stage, I was wondering about this. And then I looked at people, you know, the people in the city, if they go on holiday, they either go to the sea or they go to the Kruger National Park, or they go to a reserve like the, the Sabi Sands or the Greater Kruger areas, the Mavati, which spread areas is so stunningly beautiful. And their connection with an animal or with the wildlife or creation is of utmost importance also for mental health. Now that we think about COVID and everyone was inside, I. 100% sure everyone will agree with the fact that if you get half a chance, you want to be out there, you want to <laughs> get in your four by four and go to the sea or go to where there's animals and wild animals. So for me, it's pretty obvious that maybe it's a primal thing that we all crave to be in the wild or to be with wildlife. And, you know, out in the sun, out on a canoe, you know, rowing or so. And I just think it makes people so, so happy. And if you talk to them as well, they always say to us, you guys are so blessed. And you, if I, if I have a half a chance, I will come and help you guys. And it's true, they do. There's now some of the bigger institutions that, that say, listen, if you want your leave and you also want to volunteer, just go to these places. And we see a lot of people coming through and volunteering at Care for Wild. That's in finances, that's veterinarians, that's doctors, you know, professional people. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're just dirty and, <laughs> <laughs> and helping. And, and they, they smile and, you know, and I thought, well, that's the way to go. Uh, it's a craving deep, deep within each and every one of us. And it's so absolutely important to have this healthy people and healthy ecosystems, you know, and healthy animals. I truly believe that makes us better people. Yeah, I love that perspective because, you know, there's so much talk about the importance of the climate and environment just for, you know, more of the health of the planet uh, on a big scale, which is super important, of course. But we just kind of forget how connected we are as humans to all of these wild spaces. And like you just said, you know, <laughs> when we're at work too much or in the city too much or in the house too much, what we want to do is get outside, see the sunsets, be in nature and all that stuff. So important to who we are at such a deep level that something that maybe we just don't even fully understand. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. I really love that perspective. Can you go into how Care for Wild came about or maybe I'm not sure which which was first, you know, this this rhino poaching crisis seemed like it really started to take off in 2008 in South Africa. But was it the rhino poaching crisis that kind of caught your eye first? Just how did this all come about in your world from your perspective? You know, if I think of, uh, back up a little bit, you know, I studied industrial psychology, believe it or not, um, and then veterinary assistant and... Uh, I think it was just a journey. And then uh, at the Endangered Species Protection Unit, I was a captain there and uh, working basically in the investigation side of things as well with that unit, you know, such important unit. And at that year, it is in the 90s and then early uh, 2000, you know, we haven't seen this onslaught. It was also more abalone, crayfish, believe it, mm. also ivory. So this products that they smuggle, smuggle, it is really the crime against wildlife. And that's 
very sad if you think about it, all that, those cases and so on. So forever I was such a keen follower and, and advocate for uh, wildlife. And then at one stage I started the game capture school that did the chemical capture of, of wild animals for veterinarians as well as non-veterinarians. And that's courses and also the management of animals in captivity, because remember, it doesn't matter how we look at it, there's somewhere animals in captivity, and someone needs to teach that people how to work with that animals. You can't just say you can't have it in captivity, they have it in captivity. So how do you work with them? How do you look after them? How do you release them again? So eventually I got, my eldest son had to go to school. So we've done a lot of game capture during that years when he was still <laughs> not going to school. So done a lot of game capture. So just throw myself into that. It's absolutely something else to, to work with animals so closely. Mm. And then uh, started the, the wildlife center at Sondela and Warmbath in Limpopo. And then also Tambuti in the area of Limpopo. So in 2011, moved to the Lowfeld and now spread area near the Kruger National Park. Mm -hmm. And I got this call from the Kruger and I say, you know, they made a decision. And now thinking back about that decision and how important that must have been, a full circle, decided to start saving rhino orphans uh, that's left in, in the Kruger, you know, as, as an orphan, injured, alone, hungry. So I said, yeah, no, I'm, I'm okay. I will, I will definitely help with that. But I never knew it will become so many orphans. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you in 2014 and 2015, I think it was brandy. Uh, we live in episodes. We, it was just a, an animal coming in, a rhino coming in, another rhino coming in, sometimes a day apart. So you could clearly see how this rhino poaching pandemic almost, you know, developed by the calf we receive. You know, um, I can remember with one of those weeks, it was four rhinos coming in the same week and, and one came down on my hand and broke two of my fingers and only two weeks later I could go to the doctor and sort that out and if it knew and so the one thing just led to the other thing and it became a life's journey and I'm sure the people saw that we now out of the orphans winter that came in 2014 and then Storm, another bull out of Limpopo, his whole family were killed, mm. came, came to me in 2012. They, two orphans, have now a baby. So it's proven. And, <laughs> and when, I, when I looked at that baby, that morning when the sun rise, and it, she's with her mom, it was the most amazing feeling in my heart to be part of that journey of saving rhinos and into this conservation of rhinos. It was just something else. And it, it almost deleted all the nights that is so difficult, all, all the bottles of milk, all the <laughs> rhino, rhino defecation, picking that up. <laughs> it's just like, hey, this is the absolutely perfect example of rhino. Yeah, so it's a, it's a big, important uh, journey that, that I think God just say, this is your journey, just, just walk with it, just mm. be the instrument, and, and I will do the rest. And I think, that's, that's, I think that sums it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah well, that's definitely quite the journey, even more than I, I realized that you've been on. What was kind of the turning point for actually starting the organization Care for Wild? Because it seems like you've been doing a lot of this work and related work up to that point, but what what kind of compelled you to actually make this an organization yeah it's it's so true at first it was you know you have to start a business it actually really started because one of the animals that came in someone heard about it and said to me but he wants to sponsor and help me with this rhino mm. and i said okay um you but but i need to give you something back so it brings me to a point where you have to start a company a non-profit so that people that wants to help can actually donate towards a good, good course. And that's how it started. And it's a wise care for wild is 
is exactly what we do, you know. That is what we do because we're also taking in, we had leopard in our, we're taking raptors in, uh, we had a baby Ellie in, your elephant in, <laughs> that eventually went to herd. And so through the years, I've done snakes, raptors, cat species, and then suddenly these, these little blocks of rhinos, you know, these gray little things came <laughs> along. And I have to tell you, they have the sweetest hearts. And I think God just, that just, you know, pack a lot of meat and muscle around them so that <laughs> you can't see how small their hearts are and how vulnerable they really are. And so it's, mm. it's just, a, it's just, if I think about rhino, I will always say to you guys, look at the rhino babies and then people don't understand it. I think, you know, two tana is <laughs> two tana. <laughs> but in your mind, everything that's peaceful, that their freedom, what they are, we're taken away from them with one bullet. Mm. And that brings me to a very important role. And I love the, the name Rhino Man. And I love the story around the movie that you guys are making. And I've read up a little bit about it because it's about a person with a mission and his mission had this, had this specific purpose. I just read and I saw, you know, the, it's conserving wildlife through education and bridging a gap between the communities and conservation. And I think everyone in rhino conservation will tell you that's what it is all about because it doesn't help us saving these rhino orphans, putting them through a, a thorough rehabilitation. And then, you know, we re rewild them and we release them back into a healthy ecosystem. And then suddenly there's no proper protection. It is ridiculous because then they will just be shot again. Mm. So thinking about these people and even here at Cave for Wild, if we release these crushes of rhino back into areas, just to tell the people a little bit about this as well, we have an intensive protection zone where we have these, the ICU where if a baby comes in or injured animal, a uh, big animal comes in, you know, we have it firstly in the ICU mm -hmm. with 24 seven and, and around the clock working on them and looking after them. And from there on, they're going into a crush if they're doing well and introducing them to other rhinos and see where they will fit in, see that they're doing well, you know, have them on a bottle. And then from that point onwards, putting them in, in bigger areas where you have to look after the grass. Mm. So you can't do rhino without looking at your ecosystem. So if you get to that point, if you then move to a proper protection, as we carry on, we're sitting now at the moment with, with unbelievable rangers also doing ranger education mm. and K9 unit, a, a mounted unit, a culvery mounted unit, a proper unit, as well as cameras, CCTV cameras around these different BOMA areas. And then last week, we also had some very nice work on, on collars that also work with a little bit of a, a artificial intelligence. So all these is just playing together. It's a lot, you know, it's, it is something that I'm very proud of. Uh, we with the rhinos 24 seven, the ranger. I call them the rhino shepherds or rhino monitors. And what they will do is they will sleep with the rhinos. They know the rhinos by name. So when I'm on a radio, I said, guys, just tell me where's Timby and Olive. And the rangers will say, ma'am, ma they're at uh, Delta 6 or they eat at Charlie 2. And the connection that these rhino shepherds and monitors have with these animals is just unbelievable. So uh, they also walk with uh, tablets. Now, these specific technology tablets are telling us everything about this rhino. So as they also doing these patrols, they're also collecting data. You know, sometimes they will say to us, okay, the rhino drink only drank water once a day. 
because you can't think we rescue a runner. Right. Now the runner goes out and it's happy and it's doing well. It's not true. The thorough rehabilitation work that you need to put into these animals is of utmost importance to get them to a point where you can step back and say they well introduce back into their natural habitat where they're supposed to be. So we found that some of these animals with horrific wounds uh, sometimes struggle. And if we don't have the monitoring on them, you can very easily miss that maladaptation phase where they're from a BOMA confinement area in an area where they only graze or only browse. So we walk them, even the smaller ones, out into the camps and say, how, how are they doing? We're weighing these animals regularly. We have uh, blood banks on them. We have plasma banks on them. And on Wednesday, we're checking a little one out, a little bit again, Daisy. We're going to mm -hmm. take x-rays from her mouth because there's very little people know about this animal. So we're going to see if she's teething. She's still she's getting into a <laughs> teething situation or, you know, that type of thing. So thinking about the role of the ranger, it's not only a person walking around there, just protecting with a gun and so on. This person gives give his life. This person, while we're eating a Sunday meal, is out there without his family. If it's uh, hailing, we, we had a, two years ago, we had a massive hail storm on the reserve. And the one guy, we call him Uncle Dion, was basically lying over another ranger that had no protection. And I wish you could have seen how the hail hammered those two people. Sheesh. And then if you think about the dogs going out and this bond between dog handler and the dog and the bond between a mounted unit person and his horse and the bond, the emotional bond between the rhino monitor and that specific rhino. I would love to say that, that these people play uh, such an important role and it's it's absolutely so important to to bring that under people's attention that they're not only looking after rhino they're looking after biodiversity they're looking after keystone species they can tell you where the rock python live and you know where the crested lyrical mm. and uh, what is the medicinal plants in the area and I, I think people miss that when we think about just a ranger that's a soldier. Yeah. They are soldiers, but they're people. And, and I would love people to, to know that it's the heart of, of rhino man and the makeup of a rhino man is just so special. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing all that, Petronelle, because that's definitely... For us, what we want to be able to accomplish with this film and kind of the overall social impact movement that we're trying to build behind it is to highlight these rangers and the valuable work they do. You know, on one that hand, <clears throat> excuse me, on one hand, like you said, they have to be soldiers because of this tough situation we're in with the rhino poaching and other illegal wildlife trade, because they realistically they have to face some pretty dangerous situations with uh, these crime syndicates and people that come in. But on the other side, they do so much more like the monitoring. And like you said, I feel like Anton, who's our, the main ranger we follow, I've spent so much time with him and, and he knows all the bird calls, he knows the trees, he understands how the soil interacts with you know different parts of the ecology in the area. And uh, they, they're so much more than just soldiers. And that's something we really wanna highlight. So yeah, I appreciate you kind of going through all of the different ways that the rangers are helping. And you know, our film's Rhino Man, because in part it's honoring this this one guy Martin Tembu, who is this huge ranger trainer. But it's not just men; it's you know men and women do this job, and both hold this the same kind of level of respect within conservation. So we don't want to you know make any mistake there. But could you go into some more detail of what it's like when you first receive one of these rhino orphans and what? what are kind of some of the situations they come from in the backgrounds for people that don't really know 
how severe some of this rhino poaching is and what's, what these little ones have to experience. Can you go into some of that detail and what it's like when you first receive them? Yeah, I think it's important for people to realize that, you know, I this morning I thought about something and they say, you know, everyone is on the, the war that's going on at the moment in Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. And I thought to myself, maybe, you know, we also focus on that on the moment because there's a lot of humans involved and it is absolutely devastating and so sad. But people might not know that that same war is going on in Africa, as we speak, to do with the onslaught on our endangered species. And, you know, also plants, it's, it's a poaching of plants going on, poaching of the sea life, you know, and all sorts. And this is bringing me to that point of saying, listen, it is really a war out there to do with our wonderful, amazing, iconic species that we name rhino. And to tell you a little bit, we ready 24 seven, so sometimes I say to the guys, listen, we really became rhino paramedics. <laughs> we have these <laughs> yeah. ER bags, uh, three of them, you know, ready to go. They can phone us anytime, day or night, ready to go, you know. Um, so sometimes the ETA is just 15 minutes and ETA is, is expecting time of arrival. So then I, on my WhatsApp, gets, we're on our way. We just found a baby rhino that's running around in the Kruger or in the greater Kruger and you need to react. So then <laughs> if you're busy with something, you just throw everything down. We have crates ready. We have heaters ready. We have drip sets ready. You know, we have wind specialists re ready to react because you never know what you get. It's a little bit like that, that Forrest Gump story where you open the box of chocolates <laughs> And you never know what you get, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes, uh, most of the times, very dehydrated, hypoglycemic, hypothermic, uh, very stressed. And um, over the years, we almost get to a point where we, we work with, with the fluid therapy. We work with um, sensitizing these animals. You can hear there's a lot of busyness here in the background. <laughs> no worries. So, so if this animal coming in is normally been flying, fly in with us in the back of a helicopter. So the role, there's roles in this conservation model of saving rhinos. And we all know it is the ranger that might find the dead mom and the baby first. And he was on foot patrol or, you know, dog handler or mounted uh, unit uh, mm -hmm. person. Then after that, he will contact the head ranger in the area. After that, there's a very important role. The veterinarian is playing a very important role. The helicopter pilot is playing. I saw you had a talk to Jerry and I mean, they are brilliant. They, even Jerry flew a few animals to us over December when this whole pandemic hit us again. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the caretakers, the people receiving this animal in a specialized place, a facility developed to handle these cases, different cases, learning every day, no textbook. And sometimes these babies are hacked, uh, also uh, found them with bullet wounds, found them with horrific bite wounds on them. Oh, we've seen very, very sad situations. I'm just thinking about some of the babies blossom with a uh, bullet wound in the neck and the hyena attacked her. Uh, Sophia, uh, hyena attacked her, lion scratch mark. A lot of the time we saw babies and you can see on, the, on their sides, on their flanks, clearly the, the predator marks, how they try to, to attack them. Because I always think to myself, hmm. now the mom is dead, uh, horns hacked off, blood. We found some of these babies that that smell terrible, terrible. Mm. And then you realize that they try to stay near their mom, and the dead blood, uh, you know, the blood of mm. the mom is on them. And sometimes, believe it or not, the mom's not dead, but like Thor came in and uh, the black rhino baby, and it took my breath away when I saw some of the videos where they actually hacked the mom's uh, back off and she just couldn't stand anymore. 
Uh, so you you have to have uh, inner strength. <clears throat> you have to have a character that uh, you mustn't deal with the bitterness. Sometimes you have to deal with the emotions of losing uh, an, uh, an animal that's been hacked badly. Lofo came in. He was also hacked on his back. Uh, Twinkle came in. She was hacked on her back. We did an open back operation on Lofo. Horrific wounds in Sophia, where what they what these babies sometimes do then the rhino babies they try then to go to another crush of rhinos to just to just found that comfort and rhinos can be vicious themselves and if you read it up about the behavior and the behavior that we now study closely they not necessarily take another bull calf in so so the another bull that's not his calf will try and attack that bull calf. And we found some of these baby with very long, very deep wounds into their intestines. So John, yeah, if you can if you can plug into my brain, you know, <clears throat> I've seen I've, I've seen a few things that that you have to focus every day on the positive. If I look at them, I see life. Uh, I celebrate their lives every day because every single little sample of a rhino, every single big rhino with gun wounds in it or hax wounds, we speak life. We celebrate their lives, you know. So just the fact that they're standing there and allow us to work on them, allow us to, to just help them. It's a blessing. I can't tell you how quickly they work out the trust and the bond between us. I mean, there's now this little baby. She was a neonatal. Daisy Key, if people follow us, uh, uh, we she's almost four months old and we're still feeding her through the night. Wow. And there I just absolutely have the utmost respect for the caretakers here at, at well, December when uh, the world heard about these rhinos, 24 of them being slaughtered in almost less than 24 hours, yeah. we received nine orphans and oh, wow. uh, in about a month's time. And we worked around the clock. I worked out eventually. The feeding never stopped. At one stage, we were feeding Daisy every hour. Uh, she was so small. She was so tiny that it was ridiculous. We, Aquasi, you know, was so small that we had to feed him every two hours. Then Shilu came in uh, with Jerry and them and Dr. Ben Miller flying her in under absolutely ridiculous weather. I cannot believe I, they put their lives on the line, John. Uh, I wish you could have, Jerry, the, 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 the clouds open and the next moment I found them from the vehicle and I said, Jerry, you guys can't lie, land with your helicopter. It's absolutely too dangerous. You have to uh, uh, turn back to Nelspreit. And, and there at Nelspreit uh, Airport, there was paramedics, <laughs> human paramedics and rescue people waiting for the helicopter to help Jerry and Ben with this baby rhino with the helicopter pushing the helicopter into safety so that wow. they don't have the hail damage. I mean, do people really understand what these people are going through just to save one tiny rhino female? I I, I, I pray every day for mm. them. You know, I said, God, please look at Jerry. Look after Ben. Look after Dr. Obatis. Look after Dr. Peter Bas. Look for you. You know, just, Yana, you know, the helicopter pilots. They, they, they literally give everything to just save this one rhino baby and then if if the world will just listen for a second of what these people do in a day it is actually remarkable john that people can not sleep at all wake up the next morning just run on a spur again to find a poacher or get into a helicopter again or the veterinarian and the caregivers just sit for hours and hours um, 
just to save uh, these iconic, beautiful, absolutely breathtaking species. You know, I, I don't know if anyone ever seen the eyes, really the eyes of these rhinos when they look at you and they acknowledge you, they know you. I will walk in the felt and some of the caregivers and some of the rangers will walk in the felt and you will walk past an animal and I know they know who we are and what we do. The, the deep, deep level of respect uh, is absolutely something else. I have a ranger here called Ndala. We call him Double Double. You know, uh, it's sometimes when I, when I can just look through his eyes and of course not his eyes at the rhino. I would love to see what they see. And I'm sure like you've seen with Martin and you, now that you're talking with Anton, the Franklin will call and that will be their alert call, you know? So mm -hmm. it is just the most amazing world we live in that I would love the people just to know a little bit more. And that's why I agreed on this podcast, just to, to, to show them a little bit more about what we do every day of our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you telling those stories. And I, I do remember Jerry, I think briefly kind of mentioned that episode, but he didn't go into as much detail. You know, he's very humble, but uh, it's, it's just amazing. And I think that's what attracted me to this project and um, has kind of kept me here trying to push it forward is just realizing the dedication of all the people involved and all the different roles that are played from the Rangers to what you do to the helicopter pilots and you know the vets i mean it's like you said it's a 24 7 job you can never completely rest because you don't know when one of these poaching incidents is going to occur and someone's going to have to go out and all the way down the chain people have to react instantly to save their lives and you know the the numbers are going down so low that every every life matters in this case so yeah i really just appreciate you going through some of those stories and uh showing people what's what everyone is doing and i think that passion and seeing people put this much effort into something if people can see that they connect with it and that's what we're hoping to do with this film and then they realize oh this is something you know more than just saving an animal as you know kind of ambiguous as that might be to someone that's not as connected but these people care so deeply there must be something more here and yeah just really appreciate those words can you go into a little bit about what it's like for you emotionally and your caretakers emotionally um, to kind of have to deal with this on a daily basis? You know, I talked with Dr. Johan Murray about this a bit and the fact that, you know, this is a lot of mental stress. You're, like you said, you're kind of like a, you know, you're like an ER unit for uh, infants, basically, and you have to see this day in and day out. So it, it must take a toll just kind of from your perspective, what's, what is that emotionally like for you and your caretakers? And what do you guys do to counter that? That's an interesting uh, uh, remark and question. Uh, I, I don't think this is for the faint-hearted. I don't think it's for someone that's not with a strong character. Uh, I don't think it's for people that's lazy. I don't enjoy lazy people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they miss too much, you know, I, I'm that person that would rather give everything. So when, when you get into a situation where you saw even big rhino, like rhino female that's been shot or a uh, animal with, with head wounds, you know, it does take a strong character. And I think the fact that, that you then throw everything at the next case, it's just an episode. It's just what you do. It's just a decision. I think sometimes I think uh, I I wish I was a little bit more a uh, person with a lot of empathy towards people. Uh, I think there's some people that's really struggling, but we can go to help. We can reach out and that type of thing. Emotionally for us here on the farm or at the reserve or at um, the rescue center and the ICU, the reward is absolutely when that animal start doing better. Uh, we had an animal here by the name, she's still here, Maya, 
And she went through massive stress and she was an older animal and she, she just refused to eat whatsoever. But we just decided, I said to the guys, listen, we have to see how long this rope is because I have very long rope. I, I can carry on. We, we just going to every day, go for it, 120%, 180%, 360 <laughs> And we will carry on until we're there. If that point is where that animal gave up and you haven't done every single thing you could, I think that's where you think and doubt yourself. But if there's a case coming in and you give everything, and we have groups of veterinarians that's helping us, there's even people in Nelspruit uh, near where we have the reserve, a plastic surgeon and a husband and some um, people, the nutritionist, you know, uh, um, other specialists, you know, that we use in trying all these different things. A wound specialist with us, us was one of our, our rhinos that had a, a wound on, on his jawline. And he was the first rhino that we put through a CT scan. I know Dr. Johan and them put, uh, you know, limbs of, of uh, some of these rhinos through. But that little man, we put him through a CT scan at the University of Pretoria at Onerste Poort. And uh, we could find so many more interesting things there as well. You know, at the moment, we're also doing a lot on, on like I said, on, on the jawline and that type of thing off a rhino. So if I think what keep you interested every day and what keep you not going into emotional wreck, it is just keep on going. There's this species, and it's a keystone species that we need to save. And it's extremely interesting. And there's not a lot of things that we know about this. So we're at the moment also with this artificial intelligence that we put on them is we never thought the black rhinos will go up, up in the mountains on those valleys. Mm. So now we could see that. And now we could, uh, could document that and we could document what they eat. And now the ecology is playing such a big part. So I think what's helping us is we are interested in what we're doing and we want to be every day, we want to be better in knowing more and save more of these species and help more people to enable them to save more of these species. And John, at one stage, we need to talk, I know I talk a lot, but I need to talk <laughs> about the community and their yeah. involvement in yeah. these programs of ours. I think uh, we'll go into that shortly. I definitely want to get your perspective on that because uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's definitely an important part of what we're trying to do as well. And and yeah, it's interesting you point out and Dr. Murray kind of pointed this out too, that you know, trying to save this species, they realize quickly that we know so little about this species and you know you're talking about the jawline and he was like you said using ct scans to to learn more about how their knees work and different joints and just i'm sure from like the feeding perspective and and kind of raising them and and getting them ready to go back out into the wild it's been such a learning process and i totally connect with that passion of it's almost like an obsession to just be completely involved in every aspect of something that you care about like this and you know i think a a big part of the reward too, like you said, has to be just seeing the success of saving some of these orphans and getting them back out in the wild and seeing them uh, procreate and grow. Can you talk, before we go into the communities, can you talk about any recent success stories? And I know I've been following the Instagram and seeing the really cute pictures of the, the baby rhino and zebra. So maybe you could talk about them a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, there's some really great success stories. Yeah, that is really, the, that's the truth. And just coming back for one second is what I also see every time is when the rangers in the Kruger, you know, working under very difficult circumstances with very little budget. I think us uh, uh, receiving on the receiving end of this orphan or the injured rhino, we give them hope if they see this baby is going, is going well, you know, the people with like Don English, Niels, and Marius, you know, Tom, and and just that type, type of people, like you've been named, mentioning uh, Anton as well, and Ruben and them, you know, I want them to come to Kefwald and to see the animal that they saved. 
because it gives them hope and it's a reward for them yeah. and and that type of thing is so important so it have i must actually everyone knows about daisy and mujaji so daisy is this tiny sample of a rhino and oh yes see she came in and she even never drank for, from her mom and Niels phoned me and Dr. Peter Bass phoned me and Niels phoned back and he said, Peter, now can you take a tiny baby rhino? And I thought, what a, what a crazy question is that? That's what I do, you know, so, <laughs> just bring it. And um, the next moment, you know, they, they, they come with a helicopter and we know if it's this, this yellow park helicopter coming in. It's just this feeling in your heart. It's excitement, but there's also sadness. And if you look in the eyes of the ranger and the pilot, Brad and them and, and David that's flying the helicopter, and you on the receiving end, you don't want to give a call. Evan said, so the baby didn't make it. You want to tell them this baby is thriving. You know, so that's also a massive responsibility on your side if you if you have to, to phone them and if they come and visit and so on. So Daisy Key still had an umbilical cord. So in the first few days when she was walking, we had to carry and hold her umbilical cord, believe it or not, you know. So we, I think we, they, we just attach them again to us, you know. So we just make sure that we know the, 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 the surrogate moms and then so on. And uh, we had to feed her, like I said, every hour, monitor her, monitoring her. And then um, just before her, Mujaji came, and Mujaji is a tiny zebra foal and also female. And I call her the soft toy of Daisy because <laughs> yesterday again, you know, they were snuggling and, and so on. And that emotional bond we like to, to the rhino orphans, they're coming in so quickly after each other that you can form bonds with the rhinos. Uh, um, add one rhino to another rhino to another rhino to another rhino and before you know it you have six or eight in a crash and in her case she was so tiny and Mujaji was so tiny that we just uh, let them you know be in the same ICU room if I can call it that and monitor them and feeding them together so Mujaji came also in this zebra with a massive load of ticks so she was completely anemic and, you know, we also think she haven't had any colostrum. So we also went out with a veterinarian's daughter, another, giving her the blood of another zebra. And yeah, she was just, she just came alive, you know. So Gave Wild also have a bank of rhino blood and rhinoplasma and also other, uh, other animals. And uh, thanks to Dr. Marita Roth, we also have plasma for the eyes if they come in with ulcers the rhino baby, so immediately we could give Daisy rhinoplasma from other rhinos. So it's carry, remember, colostrum and rhinoplasma is carrying the antibodies of that species. So it helps mm -hmm. them building up that immunity. And thinking about my fridge, if you open my fridge, it looks like a little <laughs> bit of a, a, a <laughs> vampire looking at this, <laughs> this blood, it's blood hanging there, <laughs> and then this plasma, and then this smoke. So eventually, we went and got a, um, <laughs> a freezer where we can also now be doing a lot of work on rhino milk. So, so when you look and if you if you decided to save rhinos, you must decide to live this. To breathe it, to eat it, to drink it. So that's your life. So if you if you have to just make sure that you you have to know more about rhino milk. So that's a whole new uh, episode. There's been studies being done on rhino milk, but we wanted to know what's in the colostrum, what's in it. So we've got milk now from winter that have her baby now Blizzy, and we've got milk now from her with her little baby that we can make a new formula to sustain these animals better so that we can put a healthy, well-fed rhino back into the wild one day to make sure that we have the species surviving. And it, it, people always think you can't uh, milk a rhino. I can tell you you can milk a rhino. <laughs> I can tell you how the rhino milk tastes. I can tell you how colostrum tastes. I can tell you. <laughs> 
I can tell you all these things. So, so, uh, oh man, you must just enjoy it and be passionate and energetic about it. And they give so much back every day, every second, where they mud bath, go mud bath where they mud bath and feel <laughs> the energy there. You know, it's just absolutely intrigued by this species that we know not a lot of. So just find it out. Just, just, can I tell you how it tastes? Can I tell you how rhino milk tastes? Yeah, please. <laughs> please tell me what you think how it tastes. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm imagining it's similar to cow's milk, but I, I have no idea. Yeah, curious. You're curious. I can tell you exactly how it tastes like. It tastes like a little, it's, it is not rhino milk or cow's milk. It is, it is um, a little bit of a combination <laughs> uh, <laughs> of ideal milk, but it is really very sweet. But and not fatty at all. It mm. is not fatty at all. It is watered down uh, like crazy, you know. But it's mm. definitely not cow's milk. It's very sweet. There's a very nice after <laughs> after taste as well. <laughs> you can taste vanilla in it, you know. And oh, it's just if you then know it, you know. It's, yeah, yeah. It's from there on, I also know how zebra milk tastes like, and <laughs> and eland milk and kudu milk and. Uh, you know so so like i say again you must just love what you do and throw everything that you can towards that yeah 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 it's amazing i mean i i i think going into this conversation you know we have a, a small episode about the old tula tula rhino orphanage uh we kind of cover that tragic incident that happened there and that was really my only reference point for what happens at an orphanage and i've i've never actually been personally myself this that was all captured before i was involved in this project but yeah hearing you talk about all of these different aspects of it it's just i mean you're you're really running one heck of an operation there <laughs> to say the least yes and you know the different stages of these big groups of rhinos is you have a rhinos in icu then i have rhinos that's been very very ill and injured at different other places uh, where we have a, a kitchen area, I call it a thaw area. Then there's quarantine, quarantine rhinos. Then there's uh, rhinos in processes of releasing. Then there's range expansion in areas as big as 18,000 hectares. So Kefir World is, is, is a quite a big operation. And then also taking hands in the, the communities surrounding Care for Wild is, is absolutely important when we look at these different phases of conservation and release. And the release site is also a world-renowned uh, world heritage site uh, known for the ecology. And it's a mountain lands area <clears throat> near Barberton, near the Swaziland border. And uh, to make sure that you dominate that, that area is again and making sure it's ready to receive rhinos. Just take my hat off to our donors that's buying into this type of, of rewilding conservation, biodiversity conservation. John, is important to, to the rewilding, you all know, is at the moment big conversations in conservation where a rhino, if you look after a rhino and protect a rhino, you're actually protecting uh, what also occurs in that area. If it's pangolins, if it's uh, rock pythons or pythons, if it's birds, if it's other smaller antelopes like the black rhino, a keystone species, will break the bronze, uh, branches. And uh, there's a little bit of a community and what they eat on and how important it is for the dung beetles, the insect eating birds again. The fact that the wild uh, white rhino spreading and receding areas, it is just ongoing. And uh, I've been listening to, to the Jane Goodalls of the world and much respect there. But do remember, all of us can't just go and plant trees. Mm -hmm. uh, we also need these grassland areas for the bulk grazers, you know, like your sables. We have sables on the farm. So just maybe to uh, tell the listeners, uh, it is a proper reserve with other species on it as well. Um, and it's not only rhino. We are looking after a lot of other species as well. 
and to release your bird species, your raptor species, your owls, for, you know, otherwise you will have too many rats. So it's just ongoing when you start looking after the keystone species, mega herbivores. Every time I say mega herbivore, I think about dinosaurs. I don't know why. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries I at all. I think just this one of the dogs run into the house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many dogs do you have? Just out of curiosity. Uh, uh, IPU dogs, we have seven. Oh, wow. And then... <laughs> Uh, uh, one personal protect, protection dog, and then a Dutch hund, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, solo. So she, Cindy mm -hmm. is a crazy little Dutch. And then GSP, uh, short hair, uh, you know, there's German short hair pointers. Yeah. So <laughs> animal crew. lovers, you know, it's yeah, just dogs everywhere and animals everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so great. And I, I just want to briefly go back. You were saying, you know, when you say mega herbivores, you think of dinosaurs. And I had the privilege of going to Chitwan National Park up in Nepal for the World Ranger Congress in 2019. And I got to see some one-horn rhinos close up. And especially that species, their skin, it looks like this body plate armor that reminds me of like those pictures of the triceratops and all those dinosaurs. So they really feel like, you know, these prehistoric creatures that we still have roaming around. And it's super special. But can we jump into communities? I know you've kind of tried to go there a couple of times already. And I keep steering us away, but I really want to get your thoughts on why community engagement is so important, what you're doing at Care for Wild, because, you know, the rangers are out there on the front line protecting the wildlife from poachers. But, you know, really, they're just kind of buying us time. We need to have a more holistic approach to stopping this poaching crisis and i think communities is kind of where it all starts so yeah i'd love your perspective on that uh, absolutely john and uh, yes well you know the successful conservation of the rhino species and this whole ecosystem can only be achieved by taking hands with the community and uh, putting people at the heart of conservation and this is where careful well sustainable development model uh, it's quite an inclusive model of the local communities. And uh, we created partnerships and projects that address the many socio-economical challenges that we face daily, because otherwise this will not work. You know, Our local communities face unemployment, poverty, hunger, malnutrition, you know, with absolute limited access to the education and uh, skills development. So Care for Wild has therefore created opportunities for communities to resist crime, corruption and exploitation, and to create a better and more sustainable future for themselves. So just some of the, the development uh, of this relationships with communities like the Mandela community that's nearby, consult community. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, we do soccer teams. I love it. We love it. <laughs> we normally the pom pom girls. Uh, there's children, you know, soccer teams. Uh, there's the women's netball teams. We have junior rangers that's coming regularly to care for wild, and we have feeding schemes going on, and uh, it's just provision of hats, jerseys, blankets in the winter. During COVID, we got seedlings sponsored. And uh, we went out and we give these seedlings to these people staying at home. And they planted these seedlings and so on. So all these projects is support and encourage the young people to engage with conservation, you know, mm -hmm. as well as providing a safe environment to socialize and develop the, the self-confidence in, you know. And we now appointed a little lady uh, as well, and we have a community manager on the farm, Fadli Terblanc. She's quite a well-known person as well. We have did, did magnificent work in Mozambique. And now here in our communities where you establish an open a communication system. Uh, we also work very closely with uh, Investec in the YES program, this youth employment scheme that we're giving over 400 people opportunities for jobs. Uh, we started the Lomshu farm. It's a macadamia farm. There we planted macadamias. We planted vegetables. We're doing alien invasive plant control, you know, roads for the Mapumalanga Parks Board. We're also helping them in this program. 
So, you know, it's, it is care for world is a building a resilient and empowered rural communities, you know, that are taking ownership of the responsibilities as custodian of the environment and uh, the heritage. So finding out what is going on in the school system, finding out the lack of resources. So we started a whole division that's doing only that, you know. We have a vegetable garden on the farm. Do you know how nice it is to walk in your vegetable garden and then just give, you know how it abandoned it feels? Yes, abandoned when you go and you and you can just go to the crop and get tomatoes and yeah. get onions and get butternuts and and then you feed the butternuts to the black rhinos <laughs> and then. And then you realize there's patty pan. Do you guys know what's patty pan? No, I don't. No, what is that? A patty pan is like this yellow small pumpkin. And then you see the black rhino eating watermelon and patty pans. And we <laughs> eating watermelon and patty pans. And then you, and it's amazing, you know, and it's organic. And I don't, you know, it's just, you walk through land and you can, have maize and then if if the youth and son is working on the farm with the rhinos and the caretakers and the people at the bomas they go home and they can then take this veggies home as well because understand one person represents about eight to ten people with our jobs at their houses so a salary can only go this far but healthy vegetables taking that home can go very far mm. and that's why it's so important that they see rhinos as a savior see careful wild not there this lily white group sitting there flying or riding in expensive cars yeah. <laughs> we're not there it's like <laughs> we always walk <laughs> see it as taking hands on soft fences and not hard fences. A hard fence keeps something in. It doesn't keep something out. Uh, you know, to work against uh, crime and corruption is not keeping people out. It's education. It is a soft fence. It is explanation. It is chiefs in the area. We, our chief is chief TK Picutela. What an amazing, wise person. On our board is Mr. Mark and Gunyama. Um, you, they got insights. They've got insights that we can't even dream of. They're giving advice to us on what to do, how to live, how near a creation you can live. And then what does Africa do? Africa has a heartbeat. They have a drum beat. You know, you can feel it in your heart. There's this rhythm in Africa. If you have you felt it, if you're in the bush and you walk through the bush and there's a fire, don't your hips wants to move? Yeah. <laughs> if there's drums, your hips wants to move. You know, there's a yeah. rhythm in Africa. You've heard it so many times. If you if you go to Africa, you can't get that out of your blood. I'm sure, John. Have you felt Africa? Have you felt that? heartbeat of africa have you yeah. drink the water in the rivers have you pick up rocks and hold it near you you, you, just, you can't help yourself it's, just, it's who you are you know it's just who you are for sure and and the people who smile wide they they love hard they talk hard they have auras and i think that's what i love so much i grew up where i grew up you know when when the females were with harvesting they always sing these songs mm. and i know these songs so well and even today you know i always wanted to, i always wanted people to dance and sing because it makes us happy it makes us happy when we harvest so if we think about, about rhinos and these babies that being born at care for a while now it is not i have to protect it is i want to protect with a song in my heart and that's the message I want to bring to the people all over the world. We have to save rhinos and conservation and, and uh, think about Africa with a song in our hearts. I don't know if that makes sense to you, John. Yeah, Petronelle, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I could just hear in your voice the passion you have for this. And uh, I love the way you guys are connecting with communities and have 
community leadership on your boards and bringing people in. And I mean, it's such a great way for the youth too to get connected to wildlife. It's such a personal level because especially these young animals, you know, <clears throat> they're not completely afraid of humans and they're more receptive to, to being close to, to just have that personal connection and see the, see the spirit of that wildlife at such a young age is really special too. And yeah, I feel like <laughs> definitely I've spent, I spent nine months in South Africa during the pandemic and spent so much of that time out in the bush. And it is such a special place that kind of gets to you and gets in your blood and, you know, you want to be there and you feel that connection that sadly many of us kind of lose when we're, you know, in the cities and away from it for so long. But once it's there, it's always calling to you. And I'm really excited to get back there hopefully later this year. And, and maybe I'll get a chance to come up to care for a while and uh, see what you guys are doing in person. It'd be an amazing experience to have for sure. Could you talk about how people could get involved from the outside, whether they're able to, to come and help volunteer or donate or what, what other ways can people get involved with Care for Wild and conservation in general? Um, I'm so glad for that. Yes, they can get involved. You know, there's people with amazing talents. You know, I, the other day I was talking to someone and they artists, you know, and then you talk to someone that a philanthropist that's more interested in, in starting a church or doing something for the youth in soccer or a good in agriculture or good in finances. Guys, you can all help. You know, there's a beautiful fundraisers that people can do wherever they are. And sometimes just just pray for us, pray for our uh, rangers, pray for the rhinos, pray for the people, you know. And now through the pandemic, you know, uh, you couldn't come and visit Care for Wild and you couldn't come and volunteer. But now you can come and volunteer. And yeah, it's hard days. So some days you have to, to pick up the vocation. You have to cut branches for for uh, the black rhinos and you know you you have to look <laughs> you have to make lots of milk and you have to rake and but you will also find yourself and you will also be out there and feel like you've you've done something uh, and you find a purpose so if you uh, you know some of these uh, older ladies yes i mustn't say older ladies because i'm also getting a bit older <laughs> <laughs> um they they can knit and the, and please guys go on our instagram you can knit blankets and we're not giving it only for the rhinos we use it in the community for this primary school this high school there's a church you know just get involved just open your heart and find what you love and how you want to support and and we will just open that door and make you part of the care for wild family and at the moment, you know, the ranch expansion, the conservation of biodiversity, you know, like I say, if you're ecologists, if you, I don't know, maybe if you can work on our cars, <laughs> if you can change the tire. <laughs> I, I found that I can't change it. I thought I can change the tire. But, but the other day I found I couldn't change the tire. That was ridiculous. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do that, 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 you know, just opening the, to get the tire off, you know, so I had to keep someone. And the people just laughed at me, uh, laughed at me. But we also do water conservation. So sometimes go out and clean the rivers because uh, how important is, is uh, the water flow, the, the water quality, you know, to help us build something. We have to build a storeroom now. I don't think you realize, John, how how much we're doing at Care for Walton and it is actually, you know, to save people, to save the rhinos, the, uh, and to save tomorrow. It's just a vehicle for people to get involved and to find purpose through through a beautiful mission again. So, guys, just reach out when you're lonely and when you're not lonely <laughs> and you just want to do something or yeah. you can write a song. Just get involved. It's 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 a lovely way. To, to save the planet, because that's what we stand for. We all know the trouble that we're in. So just get involved. Just contact us. Yeah, that's so great. And yeah, there's almost an unlimited way, amount of ways that you can get involved, like you were saying. Is there anything that you wish people would ask you more that you don't get asked enough? I know we've asked a lot of questions here, but I'm just curious if there's anything that you're always, you know, I wish people would ask this question. 
Yes, they, I think personally, uh, I'm a very energetic person and uh, I, I would love to tell you one more story so that you can see the, the absolute buy-in into what we do on the different dimensions and levels. I think that's something that people don't understand is the levels and the dimensions that we live in. And maybe through this one story, you, you will hear how I see the people that I work with and the respect I've got for them. And, and I don't get the time always to, to tell them how much I love them and how much I see the absolute efforts and commitment. We had an animal over December and fell ill. And eventually there was a lot of rain during the rainy season. But if I tell you guys a lot of rain, you know when you're in your last pair of shoes and it's, it's all so wet and mm. you're wet all the time <laughs> looking after these babies. And eventually you might just sit in the rain and you just... <laughs> offload another animal that came just been saved uh, from this Lata area and the Mala Mara area. You know, it's a black rhino baby and just came in and they offloaded and it's, it is just raining. And what happened during that period of, of December, every day was very, very, very hard at Careful Wild, but we never stopped just saying, guys, we're going to save another one and going to save another one and to see through my eyes what people will give is absolutely amazing and I want to give each and every one of them a medal of, of courage you know when people uh, will die for something in the war and they give you that medal mm. or the red cross medal for yeah. courage I want to give people that medals for December one of the rhinos went into the river when the river came down. And a lot of us was that day in the river. And this is something that people might not know. And at one stage, I looked to my side and there was one of the rangers. And I said, Ruben, can you swim? And he looked at me and he said, my radio name is Papa One. And he said, no, ma'am, I can't swim. And I said, why are you in the river? And he looked at me and said, because we're saving a rhino. And the next moment I grabbed his hand because I know the river is coming down. But he didn't think about his life. He didn't think for one second that he could drown. And at that second, I got that feeling over me that if you are willing to give your life for something. It is a lot to decide if I can't die for something, how can I live for something? So they were at that second when we were all just diving into the river to save a rhino's life. Give, were absolutely more than willing to give their lives for that rhino. And I don't know if people realize that the people in Africa and the rangers and the keepers is completely committed to these animals that we look after. So, John, if I can tell you that bit that, 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 I, that I saw in December 2021, what people are willing to give to save this animals. I'm just glad that I'm alive to be in that person's life to see what they will give and I think that's a story that I will take with me I mean people were dead tired we were sleeping underneath on 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 concrete just to save a baby we gave absolutely everything for these animals and that is the hard of careful wild. That is what we give every single day. The keepers, the rangers, the dog handlers, the people in the office looking after us. We had a coffee station 
because we never even go to our house that's 50 meters away, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we just scared that we will lose this animal. So, guys, just, just hear me. We live in episodes. We have to be that generation that safe this iconic species. We mustn't be the generation that say we lost the rhino. Not, not on our clock. Not at all on our clock. Yeah, Petronella, that's such a beautiful story. And I think that story and a lot of the other ones you share just shows the amount of courage and passion and, you know, really hope in kind of a dark situation. There's so many people that are doing so much and giving every bit of themselves for this cause that it's really inspiring and inspires me to want to take action and do my part in all of this as well. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. I don't know if you have any other parting words. I feel like that was kind of a great way to end it, but um, if you do include those, but otherwise, how can people follow Care for Wild and be more in tune with what you guys are doing? Yes, we on Instagram, Care for Wild, and then we also have a UK and US board and nonprofit there. So sometimes through the ESGs is environment social skills and governance you know i know some of the companies can get involved there there's different animals that you can adopt you can even adopt a ranger you can adopt and you can go for your like i said just go on our website it's uh, www.careforwild.co.za and uh, john absolutely thank you for what you guys are doing and and thank you for your for you as well you committed to rhino man and, and, you know, this whole conservation model. So, yeah, let's go for it and just save as many rhinos and people as we can. Yeah, thank you, Petronel. And thank you so much for spending time with us today and yeah, bringing us a little more into your world. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast.